Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Post in Black, where we celebrate black excellence behind the lens. Today, we have a very, very, very special episode for you. We have Spencer Reich, editor and member of ACE, with us in the building. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? Oh, I'm doing great. We are happy to have you. We know we've been uh, seeing your support on social media, seeing your work. And we're very thankful to have you in person yeah. here at Dr. Self Tech. Grateful to be here. <laughs> yes, yes. So you've seen the show, yes. you've listened to the podcast. You know, before we jump into the hard hitting stuff, <laughs> we just want to ask you a little icebreaker. So if you were stuck on an island for the rest of your life, but you could only have one genre of music or one band, what would it be or who would it be? Oh, genre, I think. Mm. Does decade count? You can any decade. It's fine. Okay, then sixties. I okay, think would okay. be. I know it's not genre, but yeah, I no, think that good. would be the genre. Yeah. It would be sixties. Okay, and one band. Oh god, that's so hard. Yeah, Simon and Garfunkel. Okay, <laughs> probably. Okay, okay. That's yeah. They're just you can listen to them anytime. Look at that. <laughs> I, I I like that, and I think I've heard a song, but I'm not too familiar with all the music. Yeah. So, but sixties genre. Mm -hmm. I think that's a. That's an, you know what? That's an excellent answer, actually, <laughs> because that covers a few different people, a few different bands, and you can keep it going. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All wide right. range. Uh, wide range. Wide range. Was that your favorite music like growing up? Did you really just listen to the 60s more so? Were you like ahead of your time? Like, I wish I lived in this era more so than when I'm growing up. I think it was. So my dad was the 80s. Like, okay. he played a lot of 80s. My yeah. mom played a lot of 70s. Okay. So I don't know why I went to the 60s, like, but yeah. I went a step back. That My parents were born in the 60s, so okay. maybe that's why. I don't know. Maybe. The 60s have the best music and mm -hmm. the civil rights movement is in right. the 60s, the fashion in the 60s. I think yeah, it's all- the style, all of that. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. obviously a tough time period to live through, but I mm -hmm. also think it's the most, one of the most amazing time periods in America, yeah. including the music, so. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> an excellent answer. I like that. You know, I, I was thinking about the answer when I when I read the question. I love Erica Badu. I'm like mm -hmm. a neo-soul kind of guy. Yeah. And there's a band in, in Washington, D.C. called the Backyard Band. Okay. And they play, you know, go-go music, and that's really big. One of their mantras is like, the best band alive, Backyard Band for Life. I love it. And I could probably listen to them all the time. That's a good They're pretty, okay. pretty crazy. So, yeah. At the end of this, I'm going to have to like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a different, different type of music, but it's definitely, it's a, it's a DC thing for sure. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> but we are here, and obviously yeah. we're learning a little bit about you. We're going to talk about posts, talk about your career and editing. But can you tell the people a little bit about yourself um, for those that don't know, like where you're from, where you grew up, and how that influenced you into 60s and all of that? <laughs> Um, so I'm from the Bay Area. Okay. We talked about that a little. I love the Bay. Yeah. yeah. From the South Bay, San Jose, shout out. <laughs> <laughs> shout it out, yeah. And I think influence-wise for getting into filmmaking, mm -hmm. my parents always say that they were really surprised I got into filmmaking because I was always kind of into science growing up. Oh, wow. Um, but they took us to the movies every week. Oh, and yeah. And we would, after not just like watch a movie with my parents, we would then they would ask us a bunch of questions. And to them, yeah. it was just like they wanted to have us engaged yeah. and not just, you know, we watch a movie and then go home. Yeah. It was, um, you know, what did you think about the story? What did it mean? And did you like it? Mm -hmm. What would you rate it out of 10? You know, oh, and then God. as you get older, you get more philosophical, I think. But yeah. when you were little, it was starting with like, okay, what's your rating for that movie? And then, you know, simple questions. <laughs> yeah. And then we got more and more into it. Yeah. So um, I didn't really come to the conclusion that I wanted to be a filmmaker until I was 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it was really in there like from the time I was young. Yeah. yeah. So I do think it's funny when my parents initially, when I was like, I'm going to be a filmmaker, and they were very like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and like, then looking back, I'm like, well, you guys definitely planted that seed. Mm -hmm. um, and again, with the 60s thing where the influence came in, I'm not 100% positive, but my but, parents did like open our world to a lot of things. Yeah. I was just talking with my mom the other day about how she showed us, oh God, I'm blanking, Fred Astaire and Shirley Temple, is that who it is? The okay. tap dancing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Shirley Temple for sure, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it's like something that, why would I have watched Shirley Temple? That's way before my time, but she just wanted to show us. She also, we were talking about, she made us watch Roots when we were little. Mm. Made sounds bad. Had us watch mm -hmm. Roots. Um, and <laughs> yeah. she was like, you guys are not going to be ignorant to what Roots is and what impact yeah. it had. Stuff like that. Um, so I feel like she was really good. Both my parents, but especially my mom yeah. was like really good at yeah. showing us that's really, that's really powerful. And it, it's exciting to, you know, even even my background with my brother and I, like that was something our dad did too, you know. We went to the movies, you know, Christmas. Every year when I had a birthday, I just wanted an AMC gift card <laughs> and some brownies and lasagna. That was that was that was game over for That's me. That's like a perfect birthday. You know, come on, see, we on the same page. Yeah. And it was just like it was really, really fun experience. But I like the tidbit of 
what did you rate that movie? What you think? You're like, it's introducing the thinking, getting the wheels yeah. turning. And then when you talk about, you know, watching Roots, you know, considering what's going on in this climate today, yeah. and, you know, in the state of Florida, shout out to our Florida fans. I love y'all, <laughs> everything, but but they're trying to erase history, yeah. saying slaves chose or what, I don't even know what they're saying, but it's nonsense. Yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> if you don't teach history eventually it could go away if we're not teaching because you mess around and just grow up like, oh, no, this is how we were always treated. Like, no, 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 no. Learn your history. Rosa Parks, yeah. all those things. So yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so with that being said, you kind of were introduced just to go into the movies and filmmaking. But how did you, what what was the bug, I guess, about that 17 or 18 years old that said, mm, I want to get into filmmaking? Because I even read in the article that you didn't necessarily start in post, like writing, directing. That's what you wanted to do. Well. I didn't really know about posts. Okay. So gotcha. I feel like mine isn't necessarily unique mm -hmm. in that way. Um, because, you know, you see all the credits, but yeah. what do you really hear about? It's right. writers, directors, right? actors, of course. But yeah, I definitely sure. knew I didn't want to be an actor. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I always liked writing, not scripts at the time, but mm -hmm. just in general. From the time I was really little, I loved writing. Okay. Um, so I was like, oh, I'll do that. Yeah. You know, just sort of not knowing much. Yeah. Um, and then I just started playing around with writing screenplays a mm. bit. And because I didn't know, I had no idea how to pursue writing. So I thought directing somehow seemed more tangible, okay. which I find kind of ironic because <laughs> <laughs> directing, like in hindsight, I'm like, oh my God, directing is it's, tough it, to get into. Yeah. No, it's crazy. I, mean, I used to think to directing was just holding the camera. And I was like, that's not even a director. That's a DP. <laughs> that's, a D <laughs> that's what I used to think too. <laughs> when I was too. a little too, I was like, oh, they hold the camera. That's the director. Yeah. I mean, yeah. completely thought the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I'm not alone. But um. <laughs> Yeah, then as I started in my senior year of high school, they had the first um, broadcast journalism class okay. uh, where it was like the full thing. You had to shoot things and edit them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I realized I didn't like shooting there, but I still, um, it was also my first like taste of touching editing software, but it never really occurred to me still. It's like, oh, this that I'm doing here is yeah. what they do to make movies. Like right. it still didn't quite click yet. Yeah. And I moved to LA with the idea that I was going to be a, a filmmaker director writer still was in my mind and then I went to film school okay and um I skipped over a little bit I guess because no, by the time I went fine. to film school I already knew I wanted to be an editor okay but um I think it was just because once I was here I was starting to like not direct but mm -hmm. get a little bit on sets and was like oh I hate being on set <laughs> like this is not <laughs> for me at all I mean I really respect people who enjoy being on set but yeah. it's just not my no I get it thing yeah um but I love storytelling so mm -hmm. um and like I said writing even though I love it I just didn't I don't know why I never saw myself as a professional writer it mm. was something I enjoyed but not something I necessarily wanted to pursue yeah it could I don't know and I'm not projecting you but sometimes mm -hmm. with the writing being tied to like I have to mm -hmm. you know what I mean it, it takes away some of that that freedom yeah, maybe you know what that I mean? is like what it, it is. restricts because like versus like just writing and then oh I have to write I have to make this deadline yeah. I have to do this it's like oof I don't like that pressure I know yeah it's you also know? I don't know editing you receive material mm -hmm. and then you get to really shape it oh, but oh. um I don't know something about a blank page and if you have a deadline so that seems very intimidating yeah not to say that I would never. You know, maybe after 30 years of editing, I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I can write now. I've had a fulfilling editing yeah, yeah. career and I'm ready to move on. Sure, maybe, but I don't need to do that. Whereas, like, I love editing. I feel like I need to be an editor. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, I get that. Um, so, yeah, once I decided to go to film school, I was, like, fully mm. gung-ho on the idea of editing and just really, like, focused on that alone. Yeah, I it was basically like, just do this well, so you can edit everything you can in film school. Yeah. And it was a love thing. To th a love thing. <laughs> I love that. What 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 is like um I guess that that first job as an editor because now you know you go to school you say all right this is what I'm locked into and I love mm -hmm. it. Obviously we talk about the relationships in the industry to yeah. get that job. What was it like for you navigating a new space but having that excitement and joy, you know, yeah. even as a woman and trying to figure out like how do I how do I really make a lane in this? Like who are yeah. some examples if any from initially early on that you're able to look to like even it doesn't, you know, whatever the case, I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. what was it like that you latched on to like, oh, let me see if I can do what they're doing? So I think I went in really naive still to mm. editing. I didn't, the only, well, I knew a couple editors' names, but the only black female editor who I knew initially when I moved to LA was Terry. 
Okay. Shropshire. Yeah. Sorry, Terrell you should say Shropshire. yeah, Terrell and yeah. Shropshire. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then Joy McMillan. So yeah. they were the only two I even knew of mm-hmm. at all. Um, actually, Joy even came later. So I, when I first moved to LA, I still didn't know her. And then it, yeah. she was the second one who I knew later. Wow. Um, so really, it was just Terry when I first moved here. But I still wasn't necessarily, I mean, there's so many editors. So mm-hmm. I feel like there wasn't necessarily one editor who right. I was like, modeling my career after at that time. Mm-hmm. I mean, still no, everyone has their own paths, but now I have obviously mentors and friends yeah, and all definitely. these things. But um, I think it was more movies that mm. influenced okay. me. So it was like the conversation I would say is a big one because of the way they use sound and editing, which yeah. I mentioned I love sound mm-hmm. in movies as well. Right. Spike Lee, you know, oh. I love seeing like he was one of the earlier black filmmakers I got to see. Right. And then to talk about Bay area people, this was more recent of course, but yeah. um, still finding inspiration in editing and weirdness is boots. Riley is like more. a big, oh, no. big one for me, especially yeah. that he comes from the Bay area right. and Ryan Coogler, same thing. The fact that for he sure. came from the Bay area mm-hmm. and getting to see these like really powerful black filmmakers telling yeah. these interesting stories. Mm-hmm. So I feel like it came from liking movies and filmmakers in general, more than just specific editors gotcha. and then I started paying more and more attention to the edits yeah. and then trying to learn more about editors as I went along. But no, that's, that's a, that's a fire answer because that's the truth. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because you do, you're like, you watch the film and then I think in that, in that going back to when you're younger, breaking it down, yeah. now you go break the film down again, you're watching little things. You're like, well, wait a minute, let me look at this. Even me not, not being an editor in post, I would watch a film once and I'm like, okay, looking at the actors. Yeah. And then I'll watch it again. I notice something different. I'm like, oh, what song is that that they're playing right there in that yeah. scene? And I look it up and I'm like, oh, there was a composer. Oh, who did that? Yeah. So it's just like piece by piece over time. And that's that's part of like the, the secret sauce. That's actually <laughs> a shout out to our producer, Tatiana. She had a question in terms of what do you feel? Because you mentioned some really a, a wide range of people there. <laughs> the What's like a secret sauce that you feel like sometimes black people bring to a film and maybe even to post mm. when putting a project together? Because we'll talk about some of the projects that you're working on, you yeah. know, in general, but like, is there is there something that you feel <laughs> like a, a different quality or a different eye that you may have um, when it comes to certain content, especially related to, to our, our, our people? Yes, of yeah. course. <laughs> um, so this is actually something my mom and I talk about in life is that yeah. black people, we go through the world with both eyes open. Mm. Um, so sometimes that can be harder of course, but it can also be more beautiful. Like we're, we're not necessarily in ignorant bliss, but we just like see the world as it is. is. And I think that that's what black people bring to film Mm -hmm. is they bring something that's really honest. Mm -hmm. And, um, it just, yeah, it's just, it's hard to describe even it's Mm because it's the secret sauce. It's like, and of course not every black person is the same. We're not a monolith. We all know that, but, um, I mean, we know, we all know that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We We know know that. that. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, you know, it's like they, whatever, whichever black filmmaker that truth for them, you know, Spike Lee growing up in New York Mm -hmm. and, uh, Boots Riley growing up in Oakland, they're not experiencing the same black experience, but they bring a very honest black experience Mm -hmm. to each of their films. And they also don't, I think especially they can touch on racism or um, without just, I don't know, blatantly saying it. Like sometimes you watch movies and you're like, okay, we get it, you know, like that, but it's just, (laughs) I don't know. It's not, it's just too much on the surface. It's, it's, yeah, it's it's like on the nose that they talk about like we're writing. Yeah. You're like, you're like, all right, you're trying to preach to me. Yes. Instead of just organically yes. blending it in. Exactly. Yeah. And I also feel like whenever that's happening in a movie, I'm like, I know mm-hmm. this was not coming from black filmmaker. Yeah. Like you it, can always tell, and then you look it up and you're like, mm. It's like it's like I noticed too when when people there there's a and not saying that you can't write for a different different genre or different anything, but sometimes if you're writing specifically about like writing about being a parent Mm -hmm. and maybe you don't have children or writing what it's like to, you know, uh, be a woman, Mm -hmm. you know, or a woman writing being a man. It's like, maybe you have some experiences, but the true knowledge is like, no, like, and you see it done so well and then you see it done not so well. Sometimes with like writer friends, um, Mm -hmm. they'll, you know, write a woman and they're Mm -hmm. a man or whatever. And I'm like, Get a female pass. Like get someone to read your work a thousand and make sure it's a thousand percent. It's feeling authentic. Because yeah. I don't, you know, I'm not someone who's gonna say you can't write, especially At if all. you have a story that's diverse, you know, you mm-hmm. will have female characters, male characters, exactly. everything in between. Um, 
But if you're like, I want to yeah. talk about this this particular, you know, okay, yeah. well, I think you should have some other eyes on that. So some yeah, influence, so or that co-write way. it. Yeah, <laughs> There's nothing exactly. wrong with co-writing <laughs> at all, at all, at all. No, you're saying a lot of good things, and I think you're touching on something there. I want to go back to even with the film school. Mm-hmm. Um, if if you don't mind sharing, what mm-hmm. film school did you go to, and what do you feel like were some things that you picked up there? Um, because I know there's YouTube University and all <laughs> yeah. these other things that people do, but you know, yeah. film school, if you do have the opportunity, can help and enhance in some ways. Was it was it beneficial for you? Would you say? So yes, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. want to like. No, we're not. We're not. not sh- <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble. No, but, no, no. It was I mean? a good experience. Okay. Um, and not in some yeah. ways. So LA Film School is where I went. Okay, for sure. Um, the it's interesting. So. Each month they allow that not allow they admit new students mm-hmm. so you're kind of with your group the whole time gotcha. um, and we were like guinea pigs a little bit in mm. our month because they were starting like a new version of the program wow okay. so we did learn a lot and there was some great things in there but there was also a lot of like hiccups and at the end of every month the head of the film department would be like so what are your you know feedback and every month we'd be like you know yeah. here's what you guys need to improve yeah. um so actually a friend of mine she has a twin sister and mm-hmm. her twin sister started i think 4 months behind us oh wow so her experience is so different than ours so that's why i don't want to speak negatively no, on I the know school what you mean. Yeah. because i know that they do a good job and everyone else i know who went there mm-hmm. had a great time yeah. but it's our month specifically we were a little bit like Guinea pig, yeah, no, exactly. it, it happens. Yeah, so, I've been in some acting schools, and it's like people had expectations, mm-hmm. and then you're like, "Well, we didn't get this, and they get, it. and then somebody else gets it." You know, yeah, I, went, exactly. I went to a, I went to um, HBCU Hampton. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Hampton, and yeah. it was very funny because. <laughs> At one point, my dorm, when I was a freshman, we didn't have air conditioning. Ah. You know, so, you know, it was like a joke. Like, you stayed in hotness instead of this, <laughs> instead of Harkness. And yeah. then I went back for homecoming and Harkness has air conditioning now. Yeah. So I'm not hating on them, but there were some upgrades and some things exactly. that they learned over time. They're like, you know what? We're down here by the water. We're, it's a little humid. We yeah. might want to invest in the freshmen and do that so that they stay. So yeah. it's just the perspective. Things change. Exactly. So I don't want to make it sound like it's not a good school. And like I said, no, I everyone else mean. I know yeah. had a great time. And yeah. it still did something for me in that I moved here not knowing anyone. Mm-hmm. And I just... Relationships. It, yeah, I feel like it just yeah. put me on a path. Yeah. And that's what I got out of film school yeah. mostly. Also, there were only two editing classes um, out of my, you know... Wow. So I actually only really touched it. Like I learned enough mm-hmm. of the basics to be able to survive yeah. my <laughs> yeah. first job out of film school. But I feel like after film school is where I got like editing boot camp. Okay. So, gotcha. We're on, uh, like on the job training. <laughs> yeah. Really. But Ooh, I did learn enough to, to get in. To get in. Okay. So it was good. So I'm not downing anything. And no. the teachers are great. So, yeah. and you know, lovely people at the school. So there it is. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I want to ask about that too, because, you know, if some people don't know Spencer's credits, I'm just going to read them all because I could, <laughs> I could go. But, you know, just in terms of, First of all, you were a 2023 nominee for the Black Reel Awards for Outstanding Editing on Power Book. Ghost, you're known for editing a new film that's coming out. We're going to talk about that. Samson, Power Book, Forest, Power Book, Ghost, that TV series. I mean, you are you are working on a, a vast range of content, but some shows that are really near and dear <laughs> to, you know, I don't know about anybody else, but to my heart and to the people that in the stars community. Yeah. Can you talk about what it's like taking that experience from film school, from being from the Bay, and then working on content like that? How did you even get uh, started working on that show uh, or uh, with, with stars and then working on some of those shows for power in that family? So um, I met... So, okay, sorry. Mm-hmm. So for no, no, I no. started on Power Book Two Ghost. <laughs> yeah, and um, I met the editor of one of one of the editors. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was on Power. Okay, and we stayed in contact. And I hadn't really assisted at all. Okay. Um, I got lucky out of film school and started yeah. cutting right away. Yeah. Um. So even the other assistant editing credits that are on my IMDb, it's like I just did a turnover. Like I didn't actually mm. do the job of an assistant editor. Right through the beginning, through the end kind of thing. Um, And he knew that. And he was really gracious in being like, he knew I wanted to take a, like step into TV and also a higher level of Mm -hmm. work and all of this. So he basically took a chance on me. Um, We got along. Shout out to Stuart. Um, So I was going to assist him, but he also knew I was an editor and he was going to direct. So he really advocated for me to already edit an episode. Wow. My first season. So I was really, really lucky. Mm -hmm. Um, 
to land with him. And that's how I got into the power universe. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I assisted him for two seasons, but each season I edited an episode. Mm -hmm. um, I edited one more episode before moving to force, but okay. I wasn't assisting anymore. Gotcha. So it was pretty quick and because I can't help myself, I was always getting a feature film on the side, yeah. <laughs> which he knows oh, <laughs> now, wow. but like at the time I wouldn't say anything because mm -hmm. I was like, I'm never going to let it affect my You're right. my main yeah, job your main and source job. of income. <laughs> but I, um, I love cutting both and I never wanted to get out of practice with cutting yeah. features. And I also didn't want my resume to all of a sudden turn into only, only TV and only then be TV. pigeonholed into right. that. So I, every year that I cut TV, I still cut a feature. You just touched on two things separately, but we're going to tap into them really quickly. First, can you talk about what it what it's like cutting on those shows and what are some skill sets that you feel like you learned yeah. on the job? You know, because obviously you said you weren't doing uh, any assisting, mm -hmm. just kind of just throwing the turnovers, but then you get into power and like now I'm assisting or I'm actually cutting. What was it like at first for you? What was the biggest learning curve that I think you had to kind of pick up on like, oh, this is different or this is something I didn't know? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely a lot of things I didn't know, which you don't realize when you're mm -hmm. doing your own assisting, basically. Yeah. Like, you're just doing what you are teaching yourself. Like I said, I had to teach myself a lot on the right. job. So all of a sudden, being in this environment, which was much more professional, mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole team of editors and assistant editors, um, mm -hmm. there was a lot to learn. But I was, again, really lucky because they knew I wasn't really an assistant editor. Yeah. And so they his former assistant... Stuart's former assistant, yeah. Jessica, also shout out. Um, <laughs> she uh, got bumped up to editor. Mm -hmm. So, um, but she was his former assistant. She's also from San Jose, just as a side oh note, which goodness. is like, what are the odds of that? <laughs> two, two for two. Yeah. Um, but she, they hired her on, excuse me, they hired me on a week early yeah. with her so she could like teach me everything oh, wow. I didn't okay. know. So, of course, I still had a million questions once Stuart came on. Mm -hmm. So I started, you know, like a week before him, basically. So I But could, just to kind of get you a little, get in motion, get the yeah. flow. Is, is the pacing, I hear about different type of shows, like or the pacing and the turnarounds and mm -hmm. cutting and, you know, a lot of action and then mixed with the drama. Yeah. Is that is that something that you learn? And then, you know, is it is it easy to step out of when you step onto a different project? You know what I mean? So with the pacing for of, for like the power power universe, mm -hmm. you know, you're cutting certain way, yeah. and then you go into maybe a drama or maybe a comedy that you're working on. Is it has it been was it hard for you to adjust from that or? Um, it's maybe it's more. <laughs> this might sound weird. It's almost more because I was there for a few years. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like it's almost you're just looking at different faces. Is what it feels like. I mean, I, got I you. it is also a different genre. You have to think kind of readjust your thinking as well. But I don't know. I think once you start telling stories, as long as you're not super uncomfortable in a genre, yeah. like I don't know if I would be super comfortable in romance. That's not necessarily my mm -hmm. my thing, like a rom com. Yeah. Not to say I would never do it or try it or be comfortable but in it. Just... But um that's the one where I feel like I would be the most right hesitant. Um but if I don't know, if you have an approach, you try it if yeah. it doesn't work, you try something else. And I feel like even between different episodes of an, of the same show, I approach them differently sometimes. It just depends yeah. on what it's giving me. So you, I don't talk know. about no, talk about that a little bit. What is your approach, you know, that you bring to it? I know there's there's been comments people said, Oh, I, I like to read the script, I like to assess this. I like mm -hmm. what is it for you that you feel like it's kind of like, all right, now we're about to get back into work. Yeah. All right, I need this to break down. How how do you get things going for yourself? So ahead of time, I read the script, of course. Okay. Um, yeah. Like the moment we get it, I read it. Anytime there's an update, I read it. Um, and then I'm also in like the tone meeting okay. um, before they start shooting. So yeah. that helps um, just to hear what the showrunner actually has in mind if it's for TV. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on the show, but if there's a table read and we're invited, I do mm -hmm. like to go just to hear. Uh, there will usually be notes okay. in a table read. Like, um, not always. Sometimes the actors just like hit it out of the park and yeah, everyone's like, and you know, great. I we know. don't really need to right. say anything. But sometimes they'll say, you know, you read this kind of sad and actually this isn't a sad moment. This is a enlightening moment or whatever the case you. is. Yeah. And it's nice to pick up on these things mm -hmm. um, just to have them in my head I before you. I get into the edit. Um, but once I'm with the dailies, mm -hmm. I... Not that I ignore the script. Of course, it's there, and I will reference it, but yeah. I sort of feel like you can only do what's in the footage, and sometimes what's in the script reads 
better on the page than mm. what you're receiving. So ultimately, mm. I'm like, I'm going to honor the idea of the script. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm going to cut based on what's given to me. So right. um, that's how I personally view it yeah. when I'm starting to cut dailies. And then um, I like to cut each scene individually. Like as okay. I know some people yeah. right away like to kind of start forming their timeline, but mm-hmm. I actually have a bin for myself that oh, wow. it's like my cut scenes bin. Yeah. And I just cut each scene. Like it would be scene one is its own timeline. Scene two is its own timeline. Timeline. So I treat it as like its own. I'm basically ignoring the big picture when I first cut. I'm yeah. literally looking at scene one as its own story and I want it to have its own arc start to finish. The, wow. Yeah. And is that that's something that you maybe discuss with the director, or, you know, it's you know, before that's just something you come up with on your own and then you, you know, hand it off for your own notes. Oh no. So this is no. Yeah. So this oh, is not how I'm giving oh. it to them. Okay, for no, sure. No, no. So you. this is just like just my initial you. pass. That's what I was is thinking. my first as I'm getting dailies, I'll gotcha. cut like like I said, each individually. And I already hand it off to my assistant once I do. I say okay. first pass, but really it's the yeah. you know first pass, but I've actually looked through it several yeah, times. times. And yeah. then I hand it to my assistant by the end of the day, and they can already start on sound. Yeah. And actually my assistant editor is putting it in one large timeline okay. with you know a few seconds between each scene. So, so by the time can... I'm done with every scene of dailies, my timeline is already full of sound that they've done and also has all the scenes in order, but not together. Right. And now as I'm going through that, my next pass is basically now it's not each individual scene. It's how does this all work as like one big picture. Now I think about transitions and also probably a scene is too long. If I was just looking at it as like one yeah. individual, not always, right. but it can be too long. Yeah. So it's like, well now how does that work in the context of the whole episode? And people don't understand that's just for television. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's 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 a lot that's a lot of like time prep, you know, knowledge and understanding of how you want things to be. One of the biggest things I think I recognize with editors and just people in post is how organized you must be. <laughs> yeah. And if you are not, it could come back to bite because just having all those things in order, knowing where it is, oh, this is at thirty point, you know, there's yeah. just so much there. Does that relate to how you've been working in your film when you were working on uh, Samson as a feature. Mm. And and then you talked about one thing I want you to touch on is not wanting to get pigeonholed just mm-hmm. in TV yeah. and wanting to get the opportunities for feature. Because I don't think people realize, you know, you're like, oh, they're an editor. But mm-hmm. for you, maybe getting a job, that's not how the producers or the people hiring see it sometimes. Yeah. Can you touch on those two? Yeah. Um, so... I'm going to backtrack for one second yeah, 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 a little no, further no, we, to say we, yeah. that organization is super important. <laughs> and I pride myself on being like a, like really crazy organized. Okay. So much to the point where this is, I'm bragging for one second. But yeah, no, <laughs> someone, it's all right. An editor called me one time uh, who was working on a show and said, I just had to call you to tell you that your project is so organized and your timeline is so organized. Now I'm going to have my assistant mimic your project. And I was like, oh, see, thanks. Hey, no, that's <laughs> you know, everybody. Y'all need to hire Spencer. <laughs> organization is key. I mean, it just makes it so easy if you don't have to think about, yeah. like you just want to be thinking about the work, yeah. not where no. is this thing. That's just such a waste of time and it can really disrupt your flow. And that's ultimately like sometimes when I'm, if I have a new assistant and I'm explaining, like, hey, I know at the, you know, the jump, Mm -hmm. this is going to seem like a lot. But once you get used to it, it actually makes your life a lot easier. And I know that they've like taken that with them a lot of, you know, and then I know some other editors who learn from my assistants because of that. And I also learned this from other editors too. It's like you Mm -hmm. take bits and pieces from, exactly. So it's like, it's even helping me. I mean, even just being organized, I think not, not, I know this is about posts, but I had so many different things of like headshots in this folder, this and there. And then I like one day I was like, I need to organize everything. And so (laughs) I had a meeting with a manager. She's like, can you send me your materials? And I had a Google Drive where I just shared a link with her. And she's like, wow, it was already there. Yeah. And I'm like, I felt so proud. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's all right there. I did it. like, brag moment. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, organized sure, I, I can't do what you do, but I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is this the equivalent? Yeah, you know, I get like brag moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fire. Okay. Yeah. But no, yeah, just in terms of like TV and 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 features. How mm-hmm. how does that work? You know, in terms of like not wanting to just lock yourself into one. Not eat both are great, but yeah, has that been a thing for you? I think I so I started in features, okay, um, and then moved into TV and still work on features as yeah. well. Um, but yeah, people definitely try to not even just with TV versus features. Mm-hmm. It'll also be genre. Like uh, some mm. editors get stuck in comedy, and that not to yeah. say that. Some people only want to be only a comedy, do, yeah. but people, some editors I know 
they started in comedy. They wanted to do other things. They yeah. just can't get out of comedy. They only have comedy credits now. It's yeah. really difficult for them to transition out. Not to say it's impossible. It's just tricky um, because people like to go, oh, well, they're just a comedy editor. Yeah. Well, they're an editor. <laughs> they're right. a storyteller. A lot of editors can move mm-hmm. you know, between genres. Well, we talk and, about that with not just that, the genres, but... Mm-hmm. The, the race, you know, the type of story. It's yeah. like, oh no, black woman. Okay, well let's give her this one. Like, yeah. No, I can do I can do Dune. Yeah. I can, I can work on Dune too. You yeah. know, you know what I mean? So yeah, sorry to cut you off, but that was just oh, something. No, no, it's thought. the same idea. Yeah. And uh similar with yeah, the T V versus feature film. Mm-hmm. People think, oh, they're a TV editor. Yeah. It is, I think, better than back in the day, I think yeah. partially because TV is so high quality now. It is. And they have feature film budgets yeah. and feature film directors go mm-hmm. over there now and actors and all of this. Yeah. Um, so I think it's easier to, to kind of move, move between the two, especially yeah. I'm still I'm not new, but I'm earlier in my career yeah. still. So I think maybe my generation of editors are not, you know, we're like determined to not get stuck. Yeah. In one thing, for the, I mean, again, I know some people who really only want to be in TV, and some people who really only oh, want to be in features. Feature. Yeah. Um. And I definitely would say my heart is maybe a little more in features than TV, okay. but I love them both. And it's like I don't want to do just one. Like I want to go. No. Yeah, where like the stories are interesting to me. So no, I I think you know just if your if your career from your from your words is just getting started, you know, there's already a ton of work to work with and to see. And it's, it's yeah. really exciting, you know. I'm gonna ask you one more thing before we get it, get you out of here. I read an article and it was just talking about, you said is, um, and I wanna get it right. You said, as far as skills go, does dedication count as a skill? <laughs> and I really love that because, you know, can you talk about that in that? just, yeah, <laughs> just in your career, obviously from starting again, going back from the, the weekly recap about the filmmaking with your parents mm-hmm. and then working on television, working on a feature that's coming out like uh, Samson and just, you know, for you to keep yourself motivated to keep going, what do you feel like if there's some advice that you would give to people in terms of like this industry and posts yeah. in general, what would you say to them? That's, advice. That's there. Yeah. yeah. So- it is a tough business mm-hmm. in terms of, I mean, in terms of a lot of things, but yeah. <laughs> um, just t- in, with the whole dedication thing, um, it's a humongous time commitment. Mm. So um, once you're in the union, for example, in our contracts, the base level that editors work is like 12 hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, so if not to say that you do end up working 12 hours a day all the time, but I've worked 16 hours before as yeah. well. So it's like, yeah. you know, and I'm not unique in that. And yeah, I do it's... my best to set better boundaries <laughs> than that now. Woo. But, you know, yeah. when you're starting off and you love what you do and you just want to prove yourself mm-hmm. and you definitely <laughs> don't necessarily set the best boundaries. Yeah. But um, it even without that, it's still a humongous time commitment. So yeah. if you don't love it, that would be my first piece of advice is if you don't love it, don't do it. Cause mm-hmm. it's just, I mean, it's just a lot. Um, yeah. But if you love it, then really go for it. The mm-hmm. dedication is super important um, mm-hmm. because you aren't just a storyteller. You also have to work with other people. You're a collaborator. Yeah. Um, you have to like work it. And that's a skill too. You have to be able to work well with people in the room mm-hmm. Um learn how to communicate, like all of it is skills yeah. uh, that you have to really work on. And that can only be done through time and dedication. Right. Um, so put in your hours, learn Avid um, yeah. or, you know, whatever your editing program is, <laughs> but Avid, learn Avid. Um, yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, it's, that's part of it. Mm-hmm. It's only part of it to be able to cut yeah. well, but you also have to be able to do the other things. So you really, that's what I'm talking about with the yeah. dedication. But um, other advice I would give is, Sorry, I'm just trying to think of how to word this. For me, I try not to think of it as just something I'm doing for myself. Mm. But if I'm if I'm not helping other people make it in the industry, I feel like I'm not winning. So yeah. that to me is important. It seems like a weird piece of advice maybe, but I think it, there is something to be said about you wherever you are. Like if you're mm-hmm. a post PA. Yeah. Can you help someone else become a post PA? Mm-hmm. Can you introduce someone to someone just for coffee so they can actually decide if they want to become an editor? Yeah. Um, Terry actually said something about um, how everyone on her team is an editor. Yeah. They're just at different phases of their career. Yeah. And so I like to think about that 
and how you can help people become an editor. Like you shouldn't be competitive with each other. Right. You want to, I don't know, lift each other up. So that's, yeah. I don't know if you could say you have like a mission statement for yourself. Um, that yes. would be part of my mission statement is like you pull people along with you, you open doors. And I think there's something to be said about karma as well. So, okay. um, you know, you might think, oh, I'm just an assistant editor. I'm just a post-VA. Well, there's someone who wants what you have mm -hmm. and you can help them and people will see the way that you're building community around yourself and helping push people along. Yeah. And people, I think people respect that. And I think it also just makes you feel better about your position right. in the film world. It can right. be very isolating to be an editor. So, I don't know, opening doors for people. Come on. Yeah. There's, there's not much I can or should add to what you just <laughs> said. That's powerful. And I think, you know, there's, there's a little bit of time left here, but I think with what you just heard out there, everybody should follow Spencer <laughs> and make sure you stay tapped in with your career. Where can people stay connected with you on social media, if anything? I'm at Spencer Reich on yeah. Instagram. Okay. And you know, any social, but Instagram is the one that I really Got use you. for no work. and <laughs> and and because this is about posts but also about films and everything, you have 30 seconds. Please tell us what we should be looking forward to with your new film, Samson, that you cut that's coming out, if there's anything. I know I know the IMDb description there, but I don't want to read it. I want to hear it from the editor's mouth. <laughs> so Samson is, yeah, log line is that, yeah. you know, a couple going through a breakup gets kidnapped and they have to work together. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a fun movie in that it isn't one genre either. It's mm. very, very mixed up. There's okay. also like, a music video in the middle of it, okay. you know? So edit wise, yeah. it's one of the most unique things wow. I've ever edited. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. It's okay. a lot of fun. So okay. um, yeah, it doesn't go where you think it tell, has a unique uh, way of telling the story. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And did you get connected with the director as well? And they, they liked your style of work and that's why they said, oh, we, you're the editor for this project. I actually worked with her uh, really early on in my career. Okay. I think I cut her first feature. I don't want to speak out of turn, but I believe I yeah. cut her first feature back when we were in our lifetime days uh, very early on. That was like, that's what I'm talking about with the editing boot camp. Yeah. Oh, oh, we're, we're, we're going to end, but hold on. You can't just drop that on me at the end. Like, <laughs> lifetime days. What is the difference in lifetime? How was that experience? Well, we skipped over that. Yeah. Really yeah, quick. I'm sorry. Saying, yeah, no, no. no, no, real, no yeah, sorry. real quick. I, wanna, I was like, wait, lifetime and stars and the same. That's a two different category. Yeah, sorry. Pre-stars pre days, yeah. I cut a lot of like the lifetime thriller type movies, and that's where I got like my... Wow. Like I got fast in Lifetime. Yeah. I got uh, to hone in on the skills more in Stars. I would say. Yeah. Um, so I met Ruth Do. That's the director okay, of Samson. Yeah, I never saw that. Um, she cut uh, a feature, a Lifetime feature, and I was her editor for that. And um, they just paired us, though. She didn't get to like pick me. I was already editing with that company a lot. Yeah. And we really hit it off. We're also pretty close in age, and a okay. lot of, uh, especially then, I was like pretty. Like I think it was 24 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was, you know, I think not even 30 yet either. Mm -hmm. So we were pretty young to be already making, already our, making you know, that move and doing yeah. those things at that level. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think it was, we just had a lot of common ground and yeah. Ruth is great. So um, when she, we were supposed to do this movie, Samson in 2020. Yeah. So yeah, yeah got yeah. put on pause until last yeah. year and then we finally were able to do it. So, and now Time. it comes out on Sunday. Come on, come yeah. on. It's so. just a, and now we're, we're going to say the date. It's going to be July 30th. And if you haven't yes. seen it, because this episode is going to drop a little later, <laughs> everybody, if you haven't seen Samson, watch it now because it's out. <laughs> You can see it. Yes. All right, uh, Spencer. No, this is incredible. Truly, thank you. Thank you've had you. you've had a wealth of of experience in your career and your journey, yeah. and it was an honor to have you here and <laughs> share it with us. Uh, thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Post and Black. Be sure to follow us on all of our social media channels and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your your podcast. Uh, thank you all again. We'll see you next time. <laughs>